In the next session, we'll be providing an overview of the current regulatory re um, framework for tailings management, as well as issues identified by the targeted assessment of the 15 tailing, 15 tailings dams uh, late last year. To commence this session, please welcome Chris Rudens, Manager Environmental Projects for the Resources Regulator. Chris is an environmental engineer who has been involved with managing mining and petroleum regulation within New South Wales government since 2006, focusing on mine rehabilitation. Prior to this, Chris worked as an environmental consultant in a firm specialising in contaminated sites, geotechnical matters and hydrogeology. In his current role as manager of strategic projects, Chris works to resolve strategically important issues for the resources regulator and is the coordinator of the tailings compliance priority project. Chris will be followed by Jenny Emson, principal compliance auditor for the resources regulator who played an integ integral role in the target in of the targeted assessment in December, November and December last year. Jenny's an environmental scientist scientist and compliance auditor who has been involved with the mining industry for over 15 years, primarily undertaking environmental assessments and environmental audits for mining operations. Since 2014, Jenny has been the principal compliance auditor for the resources regulator. In 2016, Jenny undertook a joint agency compliance audit programs for dams on New South Wales mine sites in conjunction with EP, the EPA and DPE compliance and is currently assisting with the tailings compliance priority project, having participated in the recent site inspection and review program. Then to provide an overview of mine safety regulation for tailings dams in New South Wales, John Stackpool will present on behalf of mine safety in the resources regulator. John is a mining engineer who has been involved with mining regulation since 2018, focusing on mine safety. Prior to this, John worked as a mine manager in South Australia. In his current role as an inspector of mining engineering, John works to investigate mine site engineering systems to support the resources regulator and as such has been involved in the tailings compliance priority project. Thanks, Chris. So, <clears throat> as um, Sally just mentioned, this presentation is to provide a snapshot of the, uh, the current issues the resource regulator has been made aware of as part of this project. The idea is that uh, by raising these issues now, <clears throat> we'll, um, we'll also allow us to have further discussion on these, is um, these issues later in the day when we have those workshop sessions. Um, in this presentation, I'll be providing information on the current regulator regime and the findings from that target review that we undertook late 2018. And, and my particular focus is going to be on, on mine closure and rehabilitation of tailings. And Jenny Empson will share findings uh, relating to surveillance and monitoring. And Jock's, um, John Stackpool will share findings on mine safety issues from that target of review. So what is the project? Now, Matt's already covered off on a fair bit of this already, but basically the principal aim is to ensure that the knowledge gaps are associated with tailings management are adequately addressed. And, and this is both from a mine safe and environmental perspective. <laughs> environmental meaning mine closure and rehabilitation. These facilities form a significant rehabilitation liability. Matt's already mentioned that. They can make up the largest surface footprint of the mine site. And they also can form the largest portion of the rehabilitation cost estimate security bond that we hold for the mines for each mine. Not always the case, but generally for some of the larger mines it does. Based on some recent calculations that I've, I've been doing when I've been reviewing uh, these facilities as part of this project, there's over 100 tailings facilities across over 50 mine sites um, in various states of activity. This is in New South Wales, in various states of activity that aren't fully relinquished. And in addition to this, the Legacy Mines uh, Unit within the Division of Resources and Geoscience has potentially up to another 100 mines again, um, which have uh, tailings type facilities associated with those. And approximately half of these have, have issues that require some form of management, including remediation. Um, most of the, these, the cases, these are, these are typically associated with acid mine drainage type issues from quite small and old facilities. But 
the reason the reason I've raised this issue is because this serves as a reminder of, of the position we don't want to be in as a regulator. We don't want to see uh, where these facilities have, um, uh, I guess, um, the, where the decommissioning and the closure is deficient, and and that and what will happen that liability would could potentially transfer to the government if there, if there isn't a, um, an adequate security at the time. So the picture actually I've just put on the screen there, that, that's just uh, an example of some of the mi uh, work the Legacy Mines um, group is currently undertaking. And I think that one has been undertaken for a mine called um, Conrad Mine up near, um, near Inverell in the Northern Tablelands in New South Wales. So, as Matt's already mentioned, the, the project is multi-phased. Uh, the final phases are due for completion in mid, uh, in, you know, towards the end of 2019. Uh, and at this time, we'll provide some further communication on this as on um, our website. And as Matt's already mentioned, as you're probably aware, the resource regulator isn't the only New South Wales agency who's involved in the regulation of tailings. So what I've, what I've got here is, a summary table which, which attempts to summarise in a very brief format the role of each of the regulators at each stage of the tailings life cycle, um, right from approval through to decommissioning. And, and I'm aware that most of you today have a good understanding of this, um, but I, I believe there is benefit now to clarify this a bit further. Um, th that's the regulator roles, especially for those workshop sessions later in the day. Um, an objective of this project was to ensure that the roles and responsibilities of the New South Wales regulators were well understood and leveraged appropriately. And there was an early phase of this project to look at that. I'll, what I'll do is I'll provide a quick summary of, of each regulator, um, just speaking generally to this table. But I've also asked some of the representatives from each of those agencies who are here today just to share and clarify uh, their, their role and any a few um, key points that they can um, they they want to raise is in you know relation to the current regulator regime. So starting off with the first line with dam safety, they have carriage of the Dam Safety Act. Uh, now the, the, there is the 2015 legislation which is yet to fully commence, but my understanding is there's some well advanced work in that space. They administer the process of how the dam is prescribed and the requirements for design, uh, management systems, emergency plans, and surveillance going forward. Um, they generally do not have an ongoing role if the tailings facility isn't prescribed. Um, and this is usually the ones that aren't prescribed, the ones that are usually uh, associated with a low consequence to public safety risk um, in the event of a dam break. So uh, I do have Chris Salkovic here from uh, Dam Safety. So can I ask you, Chris, if you wouldn't mind just to Clarify, just provide any clarifying points. We do have a microphone here. Thanks, Chris. You've done a good job. Um, Chris Salkovic is, is my name um, from Dam Safety Committee. I've, I've seen you've, you've written up there, Dam Safety New South Wales. We're not Dam Safety New South Wales yet. We're going to be called Dam Safety New South Wales once the 2015 Act has commenced. So currently now we're still Dam Safety Committee operating under the 1978 Act. Um, predominantly our role under the 1978 Act <coughs> is, is, uh, is a re review role, round about, um, about reviewing design reviews, um, surveillance reviews, emergency plan reviews. It's more of a review and desktop review, it's not an auditing role. Under the 2015 Act, we're going to be t um, taking a more of a, an auditing, on-site auditing role. Um, but that's, that's yet to commence. Um, so, as I mentioned, review, also encouraging good practice around dam safety. Um, we also have an important role around approvals, and that's, that's approvals of mining within notification areas around dams. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, currently the prescribed dams, we have 420 prescribed dams. Roughly, I'd say about a third of them are mining related. The other third are water storage related, and the last third are stormwater retarding basins. So that's sort of a bit of a scope of, of the dams that we look after. 
based on some of the works that I was looking at with those hundred facilities, those tailings facilities in New South Wales, approximately half of those are prescribed um, based on some of the review work that I've been doing. So when we look down uh, at the next few rows, we have um, DPE resource assessment and also compliance. Um, look, the, the resource assessment, they're the ones who coordinate the approval of tailing storage facilities under the EPA Act. Uh, and this is for those sites that are designated state significant development. Their resource compliance team then reviews compliance against the development consent of these conditions. Uh, these types of approvals are referred to other agencies to provide the relevant advice in respect to their area of responsibility. So on the table, I've obviously acknowledged that other regulators are involved in that approval process, but typically providing advice back to the approver, who is DPE, resource assessments. And I do have Philippa from, who's got a hand up there. Darling, could we get the microphone to Philippa just to clarify, and just if you want to raise any points that you, to the room as part of your role in this space. Hi. Um, yep, go, going on from what Chris was mentioning, um, DPE coordinates a whole of government um, assessment um, for state significant development projects. Um, at the moment, the department mostly deals with modifications, um, more so than Greenfields developments, um, and namely the expansion of, of tailings dams. Um, and as you mentioned, the department also has a separate compliance function. I'm in the assessments team. Um, as you mentioned, DPA consults with the relevant regulatory agencies um, mentioned, including EPA, Dam Safety Committee, Resource Regulator and Department of Industry, um, and sets performance-based conditions relating to the operations, um, including permeability and design criteria um, and measures relating to water management, pollution of water resources and uh, setting broad rehabilitation objectives. Um, as part of early project scoping, um, the department now needs advice about dam safety earlier in the assessment process, um, including consideration of geotechnical stability and design, uh, in part driven by the strong level of community interest and concern um, in more recent years about um, particularly the, the stability aspects and safety. Um, in addition, the department expects the upfront scoping to include consideration of um, alternatives, um, whether that be um, potential in-pit um, tailing storage um, and best practice design. A um, couple of points we've noted um, in terms of key issues that we see in our, our assessment team, um, particularly going back to mine planning um, to ensure there's an accurate estimation of tailings volumes um, over the life of the mine. Um, liners versus in situ geology uh, for placement of tailings and, and options for in-pit pit tailings storage as opposed to expansion of tailings dams. Um, the placement of tailings dams in um, upstream locations, tailings geochemistry um, and again just to, in that assessment function and um, ensuring that there's a clear justification and consideration of alternatives. All right. Thank you, Philippa. So Working our way down the table, uh, if it's a non-state significant development site, that role does default to the local council. Um, now, I don't plan to put local council on the spot. I believe Gary, Gary Ryman, unless you want to actually share some points. Gary, I didn't actually put him on the spot. That's okay, I won't, I won't put him on the spot there. But I just wanted to clarify that it's not always the Department of Planning that has this role. Um, there are some mines that are non-state significant development that do have tailings. Uh, there's some mines out of Cobar that fall into this category and that role for approval and that ongoing compliance um, falls back to the local council in that space. Uh, now onto the resource regulator. Now Matt's already shared, I'm glad you're back in the room because I'm about to put you on the spot again, Matt. Um, Matt's already shared a lot of our role but there is two bits of legislation that we have carriage for. The, the Mine Safety Inspectorate take carriage of the WHS Act, Mines and Petroleum Act, uh, with a focus on, my, on worker safety. This would typically rely upon, well, upon HRA high risk activity notifications. They apply to coal emplacements. Uh, they do have, there's other management and emergency plans in association with the, uh, the safety management system um, that mines are required to comply with. 
in the Mining Act space, Matt's already uh, discussed this, but really there's a particular focus on, on sustainable mine closure. Um, decommissioning and rehabilitation tailings facilities in order to achieve that pre-approved uh, final land use. Um, this, this includes oversight of the progressive rehabilitation of these mine sites and, and the way we, and that, that goes right through the full mine life cycle. It just doesn't occur right at the end. Um, you know, you're probably aware that we have a requirements for mining operations plans. Um, this will be eventually replaced by something um, different as part of the operational rehab reform um, project, which will hopefully be implemented this year. Um, Matt, can I just put you on the spot with the microphone just to clarify the role of the resource regulator? In both the mine, you're happy to talk to both the Mine Safety and Mining Act? So John Stackpool will probably talk a, bit, a little bit later about the mine safety, um, but the obligation is on um, an operator to make sure that they're um, operating their operation in a safe condition, protect, protect workers, um, where in the mine safety, mine, mining act space, um, uh, mining operations have a title and they have subject to conditions of title. At the moment, it's requiring a mining operations plan uh, and you must conduct your operations in accordance with that mining operations plan. Mining operations plan must be uh, consistent with the development consent, be it a, a local council, council consent or an SSD consent, uh, and we take a risk-based approach to uh, to address that. Yeah. And then finally on this table, we have the EPA, and they're involved in this space as well. So they take carriage of the POE Act, um, with their particular focus being on pollution prevention. Um, this is done by issuing and checking compliance against um, environmental protection licences and responding to pollution type incidences as well. So um, Daryl Cliff from the EPA, if I can just get you to clarify uh, the EPA's role in this space. Get the microphone to Daryl. Uh, good morning. Look, so the EPA's position on, I guess, tailing storage facilities is that they just should be non-polluting, um, which in our view means full containment of the waste, probably no different than any other waste facility uh, in your community, in your town, so to speak. I guess we, I've been with the EPA 23 years and we've always prescribed a, a benchmark. So our first regulatory role is in providing advice <coughs> on achieving that containment. And we've always specified a number um, that's pretty much an international number, my understanding is one by 10 to the minus nine, uh, one metre of compacted clay achieving that or a high density polythene layer that achieves the same or better. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're about, that your, your tailings goes in the facility, stays in the facility uh, for the life of the operation. That's the tailings and the water. Um, you, I, most of you would have read a, have an EPA licence or an EPA licence or have read one, but, you know, the, the first condition that always comes up, that's always been on every licence is uh, the L1.1 limit, which says thou shall not pollute waters. Um, other conditions of the licence will permit a certain amount of pollution from the site, but there are no discharge points and limits that apply to tailings facilities. So you can pretty much say that L1.1, thou shalt not pollute waters, applies to that facility. Um, how do we regulate that? Because there is no discharge point. We will look at, I guess, the monitoring that will go with that facility um, to look for impacts. And depending on what we're finding in the monitoring, if we're finding that um, there is pollution, then you all probably come across pollution reduction programs. The first thing we'll do is say, you need to correct that. So you may experience a PRP uh, to require further investigation and solutions to ensure you do works to keep the water in the facility. So I'm just gonna move on to talk about the targeted review in a little bit more detail now. Um, so we've already mentioned this, this component of this project involved the resource regulator leading the targeted review and understanding how industry was addressing those key knowledge gaps. Um, the, the program targeted a variety of tailing sites uh, and these involved inspections and review meetings with those sites. And in late 2015, there was 15 sites included in that review. And as you're probably aware, there, are, there were other regulators who were involved in that process um, the Dam Safety Committee, um, soon to become Dam Safety New South Wales, hopefully, um, EPA, um, and also the um, Department of Planning and Environment Compliance um, also participated. And, and th there was also a role there to, to promote that cross 
agency awareness of these types of issues and, and each of those regulators to bring their area of expertise to those inspections as well. Um, so the review did include looking at the full life cycle of tailings. Um, for instance, the design and also, you know, the, the design approval, the operation and the closure as part of that process. With, with my role in setting this up, <clears throat> but also being involved in this, I, I had a particular focus on the, on the Mining Act and it, within the resources regulator and understanding if there were, were any knowledge gaps associated with, it, with these types of issues which relate to sustainable um, mine closure types of issues, capping, final landform, um, post-closure, water balance, progressive rehabilitation, and, and also management during care and maintenance. There seems to be quite a few facilities that were on care and maintenance. Um, but I, gu I guess what we're trying to say is there were knowledge gaps. Um, there are knowledge gaps with other jurisdictions that were also included during this review. Um, and for instance, the you know, New South Wales um, the dam safety requirements um, for surveillance of prescribed dams, um, and also mine safety type issues, which both Jenny and John will talk to some of these um, a little bit later in this presentation. So in discussing the summary of my findings, of these findings, um, and my focus being on, on mine closure and rehabilitation issues, um, I guess what I want to say is generally, well, well the, as I mentioned before, these will help Raising them now will help with these workshop sessions later in the day. And, and I'm hoping that we can clarify a few of these um, like during those workshop sessions. I won't, I don't want to be in a position where I discuss the specifics of each mine site that we visited um, and what particular findings relate to each mine site. I, I, I'm, I want to talk generally here. Um, so the other thing I just want to say is that of the mines that we visited, there was a good consideration of, of high level issues relating to rehabilitation and mine closure planning for their tailings facilities um, at a high level. Um, but there were, there were some exceptions to this. Um, th these would typically, I'd found that this typically related to some of the facilities that were on more on care and maintenance. Uh, and some of those have been on care and maintenance for some time. And the total holder, um, it's usually they're, they're indicating that there's a potential proposal for, for reactivation or, or reprocessing the tailing. So there seemed to be like this holding pattern for some of these facilities. Um, but what I want to do is if to come to you today and just present some key findings um, and, and also to bring in light some deficiencies that we identified, I'll, I'll raise some of these in this presentation today. Um, so the first one being unclear risk assessment and application of controls. So during the review, we requested information on the risk assessment that were conducted. And, and my focus was on, on risk assessments that related specifically to capping and final, rehabilita um, final landform. Now, there were some excellent examples of where the consideration of these risks was, were presented. Um, but I'm just gonna say generally that, that was the exception. Um, the review didn't provide evidence that um, of the, uh, I guess I would say, a comprehensive qualitative risk assessment, um, other than the cursory one that might have been done in the MOP. And so um, the mining operations plan does require sites to undertake risk assessments. Uh, now, there, there's, there's a good chance that there might be some more information there that I haven't seen yet. And there's gonna be a process that I'm gonna undertake going forward where I'm gonna be diving a little bit deeper into these types of issues to understand where those risk assessments are and how comprehensive they are. But as part of this review, the evidence that was provided to me that didn't seem to be, um, I guess, a comprehensive. Um, there were some exceptions though. Um, there, there's also, I would say, a lack of information of how risk assessments managed change circumstances. So I'm hoping that will come up in our discussions later on today when we workshop about um, some of these issues with, you know, when there's change circumstances or, or managing change. So with capping, the, the review indicated that the, um, in some circumstances, not all, but the design and the performance requirements of the capping can be deficient. Um, it appeared that uh, capping design uh, has not been finalised in some cases, 
and in, in, in quite a few cases, it was unclear where the capping material would actually be sourced from. Um, this in turn relates to these, the need for these types of issues to be taken into account with risk assessments as well. Uh, there, in some circumstances, there appears to be unclear capping for performance requirements. Um, and this may especially be the case if there was an unconventional type of capping um, that was proposed. Um, there's also issues with, we found with vegetation cover. And, and an interesting one was the need to restrict tree growth on the cap into perpetuity. And we're trying to grapple with, well, how do you do that for a for mine site and not have an ongoing, um, you know, I guess management requirement to to stop trees growing within the capping material. So that's hopefully one we'll workshop later today. I'll be interested to hear some of your opinions on that. Um, with regards to uh, consolidation and settlement, there there once again, generally there appeared to be a lack of information on long term. Uh, consolidation and settlement of tailings. And, and the issue for this was, um, this has issues with associated final landform. Um, so it, 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 there's also uncertain desiccation timeframes. Uh, and there's also unclear methods for how to test for this, um, whether it's you know, in situ or lab, lab testing. Um, once again, I, I plan to dive a little bit deeper into this, um, but I believe David Williams will be providing some information on this with his um, presentations as well. In, in some circumstances, there's, um, there's going to be some differential settlement. Um, this might happen when there's a, a locally deeper void um, within the tailings facility. And so there's going to be some complications with how that's going to be managed. Um, and, and in raising this as well, the other thing I want to raise is it's good to, we want to see how things are modelled to predict how much consolidation there will be, but we also want to see how it's going to be monitored going forward as well. Uh, with regards to seepage, uh, once again, generally, there's a lack of water balance modelling um, to predict those long-term seepage rates. Um, now, I would say this has more implications for the, the long-term management of the you know, tailings that are more chemically unstable. Um, I would also say there's, in some cases, this may be an indication of poor construction control as well, um, especially in the case where there's a low permeability or a liner um, built into the facility. Um, there, I would even say there's even some circumstances where we noticed that there was um, potential acid forming material actually appears to be inadvertently incorporated into the dam wall during construction as well and cause some problems. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is in the event that the seepage, um, in the event that the seepage is being actively managed, which is the case in most of these sites, because there's seepage, they're actively managed as part of their operating phase. It's unclear to me, um, and I'm looking for evidence and, and, and understanding what will happen as part of my enclosure, but it's unclear how this will diminish to an acceptable rate and the timeframes for this to occur following the decommissioning capping. Now, I understand that that can be the case and obviously that, that really comes back to the idea of having that water balance modelling and an understanding of what will happen um, as those facilities lead into that mine closure phase um, and decommissioning as part of that. Now, I'm going to pass it on to Jenny. Good morning everybody. Um, my focus as part of the inspection program was looking at um, dam safety management systems and in particular, looking at the um, surveillance and monitoring of tailings storage facilities. So this morning, I'm going to share with you some of the observations that the review team found when we were out on those 15 sites last year. Um, whilst dams inspected as part of the inspection program had generally been designed by dam engineers, there were some instances where the design engineer had had little to no input into the construction process and the construction was supervised and signed off by a third party. Now, my colleague John Stackpool will elaborate more about construction issues um, shortly uh, following, um, following my review comments at the moment. Most of the dams that we inspected had operations and maintenance manuals prepared, but there were a few instances where O&M manuals had not been prepared or, or were not up to date, and those were particularly um, sites that were in care and maintenance. But the key issue that we identified in relation to the operations and maintenance manuals 
was that some dams were not being operated in accordance with the, the O&M manual, with the risk that operations could exceed the design parameters and hence potentially compromise dam safety. Um, for mines that had installed instrumentation on their dams and uh, over the in inspection program, we did see some great examples of um, dam monitoring and instrumentation on the dams. But we noted that monitoring data is not necessarily reviewed on site to check for any emerging trends. Often it was only collated and analysed annually as part of the surveillance inspections and reporting. There is a risk that this monitoring data could potentially identify issues, but there may be a significant delay in detecting these issues if the data is only analysed, for example, on an annual basis. Um, more effective use of this data with a trigger action response plan, for example, may be beneficial in the earlier detection of issues. The surveillance and ins inspection and reporting process was generally found to be very well implemented at most sites. Um, however, where the surveillance reports identified issues and proposed recommended actions, there was often a delay in the implementation of these actions. In some cases, actions remained outstanding for up to two years. When looking at the management systems on site, most mines um, had a safety management system such as CMO, INX or similar. But recommendations from external reports such as the surveillance reports were not routinely included in these systems and therefore there was a greater chance that actions could be forgotten as there was no way for them to be systematically assigned, tracked, followed up and closed out. The inspection program included a selection of sites in care and maintenance. Some of these sites were, were manned by one or more people daily, whilst others were not manned on a daily basis with inspections undertaken monthly. The care and maintenance regime raises two key issues in relation to dam safety management. The first one is the training and competency requirements for the remaining staff on site to undertake dam inspections and spot any potential issues um, that may arise. The, sec the second key issue is if inspections are being undertaken at a reduced frequency, what is the risk that there could be a delay in identifying issues which could potentially compromise dam safety? And finally, most of the sites inspected had either prepared specific dam safety management plans or had incorporated um, any specific dam safety emergency response actions into their mine emergency response plan, um, which was great to see. What was a little concerning was that very few people had actually tested their emergency response plans. So when it comes down to the crunch, how do they know that those plans are going to be effective in addressing the emergency response requirements um, of that particular site? So they're the key findings uh, from my point of view in relation to monitoring and surveillance of uh, tailing stamps. And I'll hand over to John Stackpool. It's probably fair to say that there's a lot of variety in the dams that we've seen in New South Wales, but it's probably fair to say as well that there was a list of common issues that were evident in a lot of different tailings environments in coal and metals and care and maintenance in a well operated site and in a smaller mine site. So <clears throat> what I'd just like to talk about today is I think we all know that the best made plan often doesn't survive the first shot of war and it's often the case with tailing dams that the original design doesn't reflect uh, what the dam looks like at any step of its life cycle. So one of the major issues that I think was evident from a mine safety operation point of view is that tailings dams often have a changing risk profile. Tailings dams in initial construction through to operational use, through to increased raises, some originally designed, some change design, uh, raise preparation, even raise creep. Um, we definitely see instances of post buttressing um, changes with a bit of integrated wasteland form. And there's plenty of examples of uh, paste fill requirements where remining of tailings is is sometimes done and concurrently with tailings at the same time. And there's a few examples in New South Wales of active plans and there's currently a tailings dam being remined now for winning the ore. 
So that change of risk profile is often not captured in a risk assessment. What we noted is that the risk assessment was static and looked at risks specifically for the initial construction. Sometimes we cited risk assessments that were relevant to a raise, but not often did we see a risk profile and an update of a risk assessment that reflected uh, exposure to workers, change in profile of exposure to workers from one or two people visiting the site, the enviros and the mill operators to a team of 20 or 30 in a, in a construction or contractor who's come to do a raise. I'd also note that the review of risk assessment that's required by a mine operator is a trigger point for an update of a principal hazard management plans and primarily the ones that are relevant to tailings as the inundation and inrush. Sometimes we've noted that that's static and not connected to the actual tailings dam or it triggers in a change in the risk profile. Um, likewise, a principal hazard management plan for roads and other vehicles or traffic is often not connected to a, the tailings dam. Now, I think it's fair that a well-operated site is a well-operated site, but we've all seen examples of, you know, a tailings dam out behind the chook shed. Sometimes a tailings dam that's treated like an unloved stepchild. So there's not always full management uh, view of a tailings dam and there's not always a, the A team looking after a tailings dam. Now, tailings dams, when they're in operation, seem to be going along fine until they don't. So <clears throat> a few of the common issues that I'd note is that power lines, for some reason, seem to be forgotten on tailings dams. I've seen several examples of raises being done underneath the, underneath the live power line or earthworks and construction being done underneath a live power line. There's been a few examples noted of uh, power line access tracks being used as heavy vehicle access to a raise, and it's not uncommon to see that uh, vehicles get used to using the tracks around the tailings dam and quite commonly use the power line access road as access to the dam. There's uh, enough examples of low hung power lines and earth moving equipment to raise concerns. Um, I'd also note that edge protection is variable on tailings dams in New South Wales. <clears throat> There's a, some sites do it well as part of the design, some sites do it well as part of the operational requirements, but some sites overlook the fact of open edges or edges into open water and protecting workers in LVs or the change of risk profile when larger machine are operating on the tailings dam. The inundation and inrush plan uh, mentioned specifically tailings, but I'd like to just point out that a commonality with what Jenny pointed to before with competent people, with management oversight and accountability for tailings management is that I very rarely have seen an, an example of a principal hazard management plan for ground control to consider the ground control risks. Now, Considering that the design engineers put a lot of time into the foundations, to the engineering geology, to the geotech stability, <coughs> I, I've yet to see an example where that's actually measured, reported on, and then considered as a geotech hazard. In fact, I think we've all been around sites where there is geotech engineers working furiously underground to maintain a ground control management plan, but there's a tailing stem on the surface where a geotech engineer hasn't had a look at it since design. I'd uh, like to point out that during raised constructions, during buttresses, during foundation preparation, uh, I've had the opportunity to talk with a lot of you and have a look at a lot of the tailing stamps. And I've noted that it's not always consistent on how we verify construction techniques, how management keeps accountability on the construction quality of a tailing stamp, how we record non-conformances to the design design verifications, how we manage that, how we report that to the design engineers and how we supervise that if it's a contractor or if it's an owner operator or it, it seems that sometimes that happens in silence and it's not always fully in the loop 
with management and when I drill down to look for records, there's not a complete set of records for most tailings dams. I'd just like to point out that in general, tailings dams across New South Wales have a fairly good understanding of why they're being built, what they're being built for. But as we know, cycles change, tailings dams change, uh, companies change. A lot of companies intend to put them on care and maintenance. A lot of companies come back to them and use them again. Uh, I don't completely feel that as an industry we understand that change of risk profile and nor do we put the sufficient risk assessment in and update our management plans. Thanks a lot.